If you're looking at your pictures and you're wondering why they don't pop quite like your favorite photographers, we have tips for pro looking photos. These are kind of the secrets to great photography. Chelsea and I have compiled a bunch of tips that you can use to make your pictures look pro, to take your photography to the next level, to add that little bit of magic that separates your work from the work of the people that you really admire. We're going to be talking about the secret to camera settings because we get a lot of questions about that. And we're also going to be talking about the gear that you might need that you're not thinking about. This is the Picture This Photography podcast where we talk about all things photography. So if you're interested in hearing more, of course, subscribe wherever podcasts are available. And I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Squarespace, for making this entire podcast possible. If you want your own website, store, or portfolio, go to Squarespace and try it out for 14 days for free. You don't need to put down a credit card or anything, and you can drag and drop in your photos, make your own website, see how professional, beautiful, easy it is. And you can go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to get 10% off. Thanks, Squarespace. Well, seriously, this should be the first tip for making your work look professional because Look up Tony Northrup, look up Chelsea Northrup. You'll see the first link will probably take you to our Squarespace portfolios. Now go to our Instagrams and see which of those looks more professional. The Squarespace portfolio looks 10 times better. That makes our work look professional. And if you don't have your own domain, you don't look as pro as you could. So squarespace.com slash Chelsea gets you started, coupon code Chelsea. All right, this is super important, this first tip. And it's going to seem obvious, but it's learning to control the light because I see so many people just relying on whatever light they happen to get at whatever time. And that's not really a great way to go about photography. And I've been out taking pictures with some of the greatest photographers in the world. I'm super lucky in that way. And I've seen that. That's been the big thing that surprised me is that like you take the greatest photographer and if they don't have control over changing anything, they can't get a great shot. It's often about controlling light, either by controlling the time or by controlling the light source. Yeah, if you're a landscape photographer, you're pretty much reliant on mother nature, which just means you have to do a lot of reps. You find a good spot with good composition and then you camp there or you revisit it over and over and over again. That's what Ansel Adams said. He would find a spot and spend six months there waiting for the clouds and the sun and everything to line up. Now, the good news is if you're a portrait photographer, you actually get the opportunity to exert some control over the light. Yeah, even if you're a landscape photographer, I know a lot of people know the secret, the golden hour, right? You go out at sunrise or sunset and you get that warm golden light. But the landscape photographers I know that take it to the next level actually track the weather and have their own apps where they're looking at the fog. They're looking at if they could get lightning in the shot. They're looking at the possibilities of all different types of weather situations that's going to make their work stand out. So if you're feeling bad, like you're not getting photos by going and snapping pictures, the secret behind the scenes is there is months of planning going into one great shot. So be more intelligent about how you choose your light. And like you were saying, sometimes that means light modifiers. Yes, I think it's really nice when you're a portrait photographer and your subject is small enough that you can light it because you can't light a whole mountain. Yeah. <laughs> but you can light somebody's face really nice. And people think sort of strobes are for old-fashioned studios, like your old Sears portraits. But yeah. really, the best photographers we know, which we know some of the best photographers in the world, if they have a model, they have a strobe and a softbox. And maybe the conditions are great and they can get by using natural light. Everybody prefers to use natural light. It's easy. Professionals are ready to supplement the natural light with their own light. I think strobes seem intimidating because you see them in professional studios and so you probably imagine it's very difficult. They're not that difficult to use. You just need a trigger. You can look up a tutorial and you can see how to use one or you could even just play around with it and it's fun. So please don't be intimidated by things like this. We have a flash training guide at Northrop.photo, yeah. video training on how to use strobes. What a do wink. you know? What do you know? People ask for tutorials and we have entire series. But please don't be intimidated and also you might think that they're super expensive and that's not the case either. They can be affordable. So if you want good light, Think about strobes. But it's not just strobes, like diffusers, reflectors. When we do a portrait shoot, we show up with all these things. And sometimes we don't use all of it, but we're prepared to because you don't always know exactly what you're going to get. 
Yeah, we were just doing a senior portrait shoot and the family wanted them on their specific beach that they go to. And we got some really beautiful pictures. I'll have to ask if we can share them. Um, where they were backlit and we used a softbox and a strobe to light them, but it had this washed out look. When we turned them around and had the sun in their face, it was way too bright and they couldn't open their eyes. And we used a go-between, a gobo, to light them with natural light that wasn't so harsh. So knowing all of your different options means that you have a better chance of getting a good photo. The next thing people are very intimidated by, but it's necessary to take your photos to the next level, are camera settings. And I so often see people see a great photo and the comments will be, what were your camera settings? What were your camera settings? Like they're gonna dial them in and just get the same results. I mean, I think sometimes you could be doing like a little post-mortem, like you're like, oh, you know, what is it making this photo great? So they're asking for the camera settings. But I do think sometimes people think it's like a recipe where you just pick the numbers, you know, 350 for 30 minutes and the cookies are baked. It's not like that. I'm not one to badmouth other photography educators, but I'm on TikTok and I'll scroll and I'll see somebody teaching camera settings and they will say something like, this is the right ISO. It is ISO 400. That is my secret. And then they'll show their pictures and all the post processing yeah. and they just always use ISO 400 no matter what the conditions. There's no one set of camera settings. There isn't, but what that tells me is that camera settings feel so complicated to people that they'd rather hear that 400's the right answer. Well, these videos will have 100,000 views because yeah. they're telling people what they want to hear, which is that it's not that hard, just dial in 400 and be done with it. And the bad news is it kind of is that hard. I mean, it is and it isn't. So here's what I want to tell you if you're stressing about camera settings. It can seem complicated when you first approach learning them, but once you do learn them, it's not like math where there's one answer. This is creative because there's not one set of camera settings for any scenario. And here's an example. You go and you want a picture of a waterfall. You could use that ISO 400 and you could use one 500th of a second and have a perfectly exposed picture of a very still waterfall. But if you're creative and you know you could change your camera setting and get a different result, you could slow down your shutter speed, take a one second exposure, and get a feathery, beautiful, long exposure. And it's not that intimidating and it's not that hard. It just takes a little bit of practice. So to take your pictures to the next level, you're gonna have to just rip the band-aid off and learn those camera settings. We have a bunch of videos. We have an entire book. Chapter four of stunning digital photography covers yeah. this. And you can search our channel for like using manual mode. And I know, I know, I know, I know videos are like easy and it's more entertaining. And I know that sitting down and committing to like 10 minutes of learning is unheard of in this world, but please. TikTok doesn't even allow videos that long. How could you possibly learn I know, anything? But I promise you, once you learn your camera settings, it can be fun and it can be creative and it's going to allow you to shape your pictures in a different way. Coming up, we'll actually talk about the gear that you need because yes, sometimes gear does matter. And that one thing that nobody in the photography community seems to learn that they really desperately need. But first, we wanna thank our sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace makes incredible websites. Not just a website, but a presence for you because you can use Squarespace to build yourself a logo. You can choose custom fonts and colors and a template that matches the design, the style of your work. You will build yourself a brand and that will make your work look professional. Some people will even build multiple brands for themselves because they'll have a brand for their real estate photography, a brand for their wedding photography, a brand for their family and children's photography. And these can all be different because you're catering to different audiences. Get a custom domain name for each, take appointments from clients, get deposits, sell prints. It all starts at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. Completely free trial. Make sure you love it. And when you do the coupon code Chelsea, that'll get you 10% off. Can I also Squarespace. mention that this makes a great gift because I've made Squarespaces for people, for artists or for friends, and they love it. It doesn't take that long. You can pay for the yearly subscription for them and get it started for them and let them take over. Oh, when they see their own work presented on a professional website with their own domain, they're like, oh my God, you, you know how to make this? And the secret is it's actually pretty easy at squarespace.com slash Chelsea. It's easy. It's super easy. Okay. So I feel like you're going to take off with this topic because there is a time and a place for using the right gear. And I know people say gear doesn't matter. I think sometimes that's true. There's certain 
situations where your creativity is going to be more important, but there are absolutely times when gear matters and it could make your picture look really professional or very, very amateur. I, one for me is wildlife photography. Right. Wildlife photography is probably the single most gear dependent thing. It seems like the most unfair thing whenever I get a great shot and people are like, you're amazing. I'm like, I also have a ton of practice, but I also have like $15,000 in camera gear. <laughs> and that's like a huge advantage. But my point is that knowing the results that you want is going to help you choose your gear. So when I choose a wildlife camera, I use the Sony A1 because it has a high frame rate and really good autofocus. And that means I can get that decisive moment when the Osprey hits the water and picks out a fish. But if you're taking pictures of something like a wedding, you might choose different needs, different things that you need in a camera. Yeah, like finding the right camera and lens for you is too complex of a topic. And obviously we have a lot of videos here, but it is something to think about. And I think today everybody starts with a smartphone. Yeah. And that can actually take you really far. And that does show just how much storytelling and composition all of those things really matter more than just the gear, but then the gear will take you to that next level of professional. It's a good camera that will give you the nice natural colors and that little bit of crispness yeah. and allow you to, you know, dial in the right shutter speed and control your aperture. Like iPhone does not have a variable aperture. So of course you can't control the depth of field. Yeah. And that's like making your background really blurry, right? And that's nice if you have an extremely cluttered and ugly background and you want to blur it out or if you just want a distinct look. This is another one of those times like settings when people want us to like indiscriminately give advice on which camera and lens to get. Which camera should I buy? I hear that all the time with no additional information. And we really try to be smart about finding out what you want and then giving advice. But this is going to be one of those times when you have to decide what you want and then find the tool that works for you. Because it's not like you can't pick like the number one best screwdriver, right? There's just the one that fits the screw that you need to get unloose, and that's cameras and lenses. There is the specific one that's going to do the job that you want done, and that's the right camera and lens for you, but you have to figure out what you want done. For example, for a lens, if you're a wedding photographer and your clients want those macro shots of the two rings together, you're probably going to need a macro lens. So yeah, that's or just extension a tubes or, or something. Or but extension tubes. That's a very affordable option. But our point is you might need different gear. And it's not just about cameras and lenses. It's about accessories too. And I gave the example of the long exposure of the waterfall. Well, you would need a neutral density filter to do that. And they're not extremely expensive, but they can take you from that still boring shot of a waterfall to a feathery ethereal long exposure for like maybe as low as $20. I don't even know. Yeah, for a bad one. <laughs> You're probably looking at 80 bucks to get one that doesn't make the colors all weird. <laughs> I mean, like... It, it is actually pretty hard. That's why we have so many videos that dig deep into these topics, but it is something to think about. And of course, if you're going to use an ND filter and get a long exposure, you're going to need to put your camera on something steady, which means a tripod. Yeah. That also is complex. There's lots of different tripods, but you should have one. And my advice is to start with the cheap ND filter, the cheap tripod, and use them up until the point when they fail you when you're dissatisfied. And then at that point, you'll have a better sense for what it is you need and you can be ready to spend $300 on something if that's what it calls for. Yeah, and my bigger point is not that I'm telling people to buy this or buy that, but just that if you're seeing an amazing picture, oftentimes it's because they have very specific gear. And we've seen people do long exposures and where they have like a machine that tracks the rotation of the earth so that the stars aren't smudging in the frame. So if you're like, man, their pictures are so much more crisp than mine. Why can't I just practice? Like there might be an answer in there and it might be gear. So just do the research before you beat yourself up over your pictures, not looking pro because it could be any number of things. And speaking of a number of things, this one is huge and it's a big blind spot people have and that's editing. Mm -hmm. I meet so many amazing photographers where People don't think they're good photographers because their editing is just not at the same level as their photography skills. And so please, I implore you, learn how to edit. Well, it's difficult because the people who are good at getting a natural expression out of a portrait subject might not be the computer savvy people who can latch right onto how multiple layers in Photoshop work. Like, yeah. They might be good at one thing and not at the other, but those people that are really pro, 
either they're good at both things or maybe they figure out to outsource the software stuff to an editor. Like people can do that. But either way, it is the good editing that's going to take you to the next level. Good editing will take you to the next level. You know how many times things are done in editing that I think are real? Just like whole added skies and foregrounds and accessories. And especially now with AI where you're going to see AI created accessories and pictures like editing is where it's at so if that's where you're slouching you'll want to catch up on your editing education it, we have so many things we've been teaching forever we have entire books on editing we have videos on editing as well but, but some of it's basic like I see people who don't adjust the white and black points and so they just publish pictures that are low contrast because the camera just captured it with whatever its standard JPEG dynamic range is and it's just like three sliders and five seconds of work and it has made the picture a hundred percent better. But you have to understand those concepts. So you have to do the base, basic learning. Yeah. And another thing I see that brings people to the next level and their photography and their editing is creating a personal style with their editing. So go look at Annie Leibovitz's work. All of her pictures are edited in the same style and I can look at a picture and know it's hers mm -hmm. because, well, first of all, there's the technique of how she takes pictures and the lighting that she prefers and things like that. But the editing is what makes it like bakes in that signature look. You don't have to go over the top or be crazy, but keep it consistent. And sometimes I'll see, I, I do this too sometimes because I get excited editing, but like you just start editing everything different. And then before you know it, you have a batch of photos of the same 10 minutes and they're all over the place. Like some are bright, some are dark, some are colorful, like create presets or buy mine <laughs> and then try to keep it within the same range. So one set of photos looks somewhat similar. You have some uniformity. You have your personal style, and it looks more professional. I, I'll own up. I this is that w is a weakness of mine. I haven't really defined a personal style, partly because I'm so flighty when it comes to photography. I'll just suddenly get into photographing moonrises, and then I will shift into like wide-angle portraits, and then uh, an osprey pulling fish out of the water. And there's no consistency between the gear or the style or the aspect ratio or any of it. Yeah, but you know what? I actually think you do have um, a type of editing that's extremely distinctive and so you that you're not seeing it. Mm. And you're an extremely good technical editor. You're an extremely good technical photographer. And I don't even think people realize it because people give you crap about little things in your editing but like if there's a technical problem anyone in the world could ask you how to fix it and you'd be fixing that in post or in the camera um, and then also your editing in post is very technical as well like you'll layer like 80 pictures together <laughs> I will do really complex things. He'll, you, he'll be like, guess what? Things. I made a 10 million megapixel picture. I'll be <laughs> like, who has the patience and the time for that? So that kind of is your style. I think the one place that you're like could step it up and add a layer of style is like the aesthetic style. Yeah. So just keeping like a color palette and stuff, but you already have all the rest. You have a technical style, an editing style, and then you just need that one last layer, you know? So let's work. We all have things to work on. See, no one's above it. And then another thing is editing efficiency. Like you can't just go in willy nilly editing one by one. If you're trying to be a pro, you need to batch edit. That means you need to select a bunch of pictures and edit them all at once because efficiency is incredibly important when you're a pro. One word is workflow. Workflow. It allows you to get through the stuff you don't want to do so you have more time to put into planning, composing, learning, tracking down clients, that kind of thing. An example is how we're doing this. Like we have three separate cameras and they're not recording to SD cards. They're all recording to a single computer so they can go right to your desk where you can pull them into Final Cut and just very rapidly And they edit complain it. about editing. <laughs> <laughs> but we're all about workflow and that is the thing people don't think about. I know people who've been at it for years and they still do everything the slowest, most laborious way. Habits are hard to break. Speaking of what we're bad at, I've got a confession now. File management is also important and I didn't <laughs> think of... That is a real weak point on your part. <laughs> I didn't even think to put it in this podcast because that's how bad I am. Can you right now drop in a screenshot of your desktop? I'm just curious what your desktop looks right now. No, that's a shame. I'm ashamed. My file management is horrible. It's definitely something everyone should work on. I'm going to work on it. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. We both have to do's. <laughs> and then another editing thing is that trends can matter. So if you're like Annie Leibovitz and that's your style forever and you get to be her, like cool, 
you don't have to follow the trends. <laughs> yeah, just be Annie Leibovitz. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky enough to be her. But if you're a family photographer and Cake Smash is popular one year, or like, do you remember when family and family portraiture, like having this ethereal, ethereal glowing sphere was like popular for a long time? Mm -hmm. And there were just presets for it and people wanted to pay for it. So if you're editing, you've got to keep up on it. Keep up on the trends if that's the line of work that you're in, that can be important. Okay, this is the last one. Oh, this is a thing that people don't know at all. Like nobody in the photography no. community seems to appreciate Listen, this. I'm not gonna say nobody. It's not a sexy topic, so nobody wants to talk about it, but I think it's super important. And that is, you need to, you need to study art history and art in general. Boring. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I made a whole video on color theory and like, boy, was that not a popular one. But let me tell you, it's extremely important because when you study art, you're going to learn the basics of composition. You're going to learn about leading lines. You're going to learn about balance in a picture. You're going to learn color theory, which colors go well together, how it creates contrast. You can pull someone's eye around the photo when you understand balance, light, and color. And that means you're not just taking a picture willy-nilly and hoping it looks good. You are composing a shot in your mind before you ever press the shutter. That is masterful photography. And you're going to have to study art to do that. Can you go to an art museum and whenever you see a painting and you think, oh, I could do that. Baby, or, could do it. You know, people look at Jackson Pollock and they're like, what is this nonsense? Like, at that point, stop and study enough until you can at least appreciate or it. Or Google it. And like, understand why people like it. Yeah. And at that point, you will, you're building yourself as a better photographer. Yeah. I think that if you're viewing art and you're not understanding it, that's a good opportunity to say, what am I not understanding? Why is this valuable and why is this important? And if you look it up and you still don't value it, okay, that's not for you. You might find out that that artist pioneered something like a new way to find perspective or balance or expression, something like that. And you know what I learned in art history that I put in my photography? What's that? Symbolic items. Like I learned in Renaissance art, they couldn't be outspoken because the king would beat the crap out of you. <laughs> so you had to criticize your government with little symbols like a skull or a certain fruit or, you know, a watch to symbolize mortality, something like that. So it can make you think of your pictures in a new way. It is fun, even though people don't want to learn about it. It's super fun. Well, and here's an even more boring take on it. It, it actually builds your vocabulary. Mm. So you can describe the depth of the image, the framing of the image, the complementary colors, and things like the symbolism. The texture. The texture. And you need to build that vocabulary so that you can voice what you want out of an upcoming image. Because sometimes when you look at somebody's pro picture, you're taking those things in and it feels pro, but you can't quite pinpoint what it is. But when you build that vocabulary, you'll be able to say, oh, I really like how they arrange the colors here and how the composition moves your eye around it. Yeah, and this teaches you how to steal too, because you'll hear every single artist steals, that is true. But are you a clunky theft that sees a picture and then just directly copies it? Or are you an artist who takes in thousands of pictures and art and understands what makes them great and then pulls out the little tiny pieces, the atoms of the image that you like and mix them together and make your own recipe. That's being an artist, not copy Did you just paste. describe mid-journey? Oh, shoot. <laughs> no, not like that. Organic mid-journey, your brain. Um, and then the, the last thing, Tony, is to curate your own art. So if you're just taking pictures and you're a person who's bad at file management, possibly, or a person who never shares, or a person who never frames their art, you're not curating your work to see what your bigger body of work looks like. And a great way to do that is with a Squarespace portfolio. That's where I make my own categories of the pictures I like to take. Sometimes in a, it's an aspiring category. Like right now I added a cars category to my portfolio because I want to take more car photos, not because I'm the greatest. And there I can take my best photos and look at what I like, what I like about them, and what I need to do next time I want to add a portfolio-worthy picture. So aspire to a better version of yourself, and you can do that with Squarespace. Try the free trial. There's nothing to lose. Drag in your pictures, see how your bigger body of work 
looks. And then when you want your Squarespace, which I know you will, go to squarespace.com slash Chelsea and use the coupon code Chelsea to save monies and to let Squarespace know that we're doing a great job. So thank you, Squarespace, and thanks to all of you for watching. If you want to see more podcasts like this, look up the picture of this photography podcast with Chelsea and Tony Northrup. We try to talk about everything, and we have like a hundred episodes, which last time I thought we had like a thousand, and Tony was like, we've only done a hundred. <laughs> Let's go back and go back to the very first one, because we used to work harder at this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye.